of December, and you're listening to Copy Time, a podcast series on markets and economies from DBS Group Research. I'm Taimur Beg, Chief Economist. Welcome to our 37th episode. It's been nearly a month since an historic election in the U.S., and although President Trump appears to be in no mood to concede, most of the critical swing states like Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Minnesota, Nevada, and Wisconsin have already certified their results. And President-elect Joe Biden has been busy with the transition process. So we need to move on. And today we will delve into the nature of the transition process with somebody who, in fact, took part in the last one four years ago. Our guest will also give us a flavor of what to expect from the incoming administration in the area of geopolitics, especially in the context of Asia. It therefore gives me great pleasure to introduce Ziad Haider, Head of Geopolitical Risk and Director of Risk Asia at McKinsey & Company. Ziad previously served in the Obama administration as Special Representative for Commercial Affairs at the U.S. Department of State. He was also on the policy planning staff in the office of U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry. He also worked as a White House Fellow at the U.S. Department of Justice. Prior to government service, Ziad practiced international law in India, Singapore, and Washington, D.C., and worked with human rights organizations in Indonesia, Malaysia, and Pakistan. He is also a senior associate at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Ziad Haider, welcome to Kopi Time. Thank you so much, Tamar. Great to be here. Uh, great to have you. Uh, Ziad, we're going to spend a lot of time today talking about insights and recollections from your time at the U.S. State Department. But first, uh, tell us a bit about what you do presently at McKinsey. Sure. Well, then we're just at the onset. A big thanks for having me on. And I'm a, I'm a huge fan of Kopi Time. I've tuned in copiously during this COVID period. And so, <laughs> to uh, so at, at McKinsey, I wear two hats. Tamur, I'm our director of risk for Asia, as well as our head of geopolitical risk for the firm. As a director of risk for Asia, my role is to really help our, our partners ship, assess clients that we serve in the region, um, across the Asia Pacific region, both in the gov- government clients and private sector. And those assessments include looking at issues around legal risk, reputational, political, financial, to make sure that we are serving clients in a way that really is sort of true to our firm's core values uh, uh, and and our desire to, of course, do high impact work. Uh, The other hat that I wear is as head of geopolitical risk at the firm, where I I serve as a strategic counselor to the firm's leadership on many of the issues we'll be talking about today around geopolitical risk and looking at some of the mega trends that are out there and how do they affect us and our operating model as a firm. Views I share, of course, is in a personal capacity and and they're not attributed to the firm. Ziad, being based in Singapore and not being able to travel the nine last seven or eight months, has that affected your work? Or can you do geopolitical risk analysis sitting in Singapore, not traveling, as well as you could have done it in the pre-COVID days? I think in some ways, it's a, it's a great question, Tamar. I think there's an operational part to it, which is, of course, you don't benefit from the nuances you get when you travel to different capitals and meet friends and can have much more discreet conversations and pick up insights. Uh, there's also just, you know, I think for those of us who are in this line of work, there's a lot of texture you pick up from traveling. You look at the billboards, you see which companies are emerging in a country. All of that gets a bit lost. On the other hand, I think for those of us who are in the world of geopolitical risk, COVID, um, not from an operating point of view, but from a sort of a force that's accelerated certain geopolitical trends and raised this issue before, it's been a fascinating time to be looking at these issues and helping companies and and uh, and others assess what it means. So I would say on one hand, it's sort of, there's been a bit of a dial down in how much one can do, but there's obviously been a dial up in terms of the content that needs to be understood and looked at. Very interesting. Uh, Ziad, let's talk about uh, something that you did four years ago, and I've already read your bio out so the listeners know that you were a part of the presidential transition process in 2016. Uh, We're seeing what's happening in the U.S. right now. Would you be able to walk us through how a typical transition process takes place? I I think um, I was serving in the U.S. State Department during the last transition as the Obama administration was winding down and the Trump administration was coming in. It's a fascinating moment. and, And I was there as a political appointee, which meant that my appointment was due to expire uh, on, you know, inauguration day or the day before it. So at a moment like this right now in sort of, you know, early December uh, in Washington, folks who are inside the administration where I was four years ago 
obviously there's a big focus on just trying to sort of cement some of the things that you worked on to make sure that they're left in a good place, be it policy initiatives, be it personnel type questions. Um, and I think we're seeing some of that in the space where, you know, obviously the Trump administration on a host of issues is trying to um, cement uh, areas. Uh, we're seeing sort of an uptake in executive actions around China and events around discussions around true posture in Afghanistan. So there is that uh, phenomenon of, uh, you know, how to land the initiatives that have been a theme of the administration. The other part of a transition, of course, is preparing for the next team. And now we fortunately are in a place where there is a formal transition underway uh, with the GSA uh, certification having happened. So there's a fair bit of just preparing uh, the materials for the next team to brief them. Um, There are now conversations that are allowed to happen legally in terms of just meeting with the next team and explaining to them, okay, here's how we approach the issue and so on. So there's a fair bit of that handover. And then, of course, if you're on the incoming team, there's a lot of just getting up to speed. Uh, There are many people in this team who are very seasoned hands, but there's obviously still a learning curve because the world's shifted. And to get a very clear sense, for example, on what is the current administration's response on COVID actually look like in the details and what's the baton that's getting passed. So it is a, it is a, um, it's quite a sort of a strange time to have that confluence of action and transition and information being flowed over. But, um, but that is the nature of the, the system. And, uh, and on Jan 20th next year, we will have a new team in place, uh, armed hopefully with a lot of that content so they can hit the ground running. A little more uh, granular, perhaps, if you may, did you like spend weeks preparing thick binders with uh, updated, you know, status reports? And were you expecting the incoming team to read that, process it, and then have a meeting with you to talk over those things? The process and then there's the personal. I think process-wise, yes, there is an element of sort of compiling the reading materials and the briefing materials, you know, a, a couple of pages per each bureau on what were some of the top things that were worked on and what are some, you know, perhaps parting thoughts for the next team. So there is that process. And then obviously it's the prerogative of the next team to what extent they want to flip through all of that material and and read it. And then comes the personal. Because, you know, inevitably a lot of people across both parties and administrations will know each other and they'll reach out to friends or or even just sort of the sort of a degree of mutual respect that, okay, you were the, the former assistant secretary of, you know, uh, and there may be someone incoming in a senior role. Of obviously, a lot of the appointments have yet to land. So there's a fair bit of that personal touch that happens, where people say, "Hey, you know, happy to brief you on what we've been doing." And that actually continues into, well, into the next administration. So I I was reaching out to colleagues in previous administrations when when I was taking my role and getting my bearings. And I similarly um, with this team, with the Trump administration team, had people from the State Department reach out. And I think that's also kind of a healthy part of it because you can go a little bit deeper than what's in the paper to really just test your thinking and um, and understand the context and what worked and what didn't work. So uh, again, the process and the personal will be happening in various shades. I mean, this is an unusual transition, obviously, in some ways, but I would expect over time you'd have both that, both those types of um, you know uh, events happening, the, the paper that it gets passed and the kind of more conversational insights. Well, I mean, we certainly would hope so, too. And I think looking at the list of uh, probable nominees announced so far, uh, as you correctly said, that there is a lot of depth and experience and you would think that there will be overlap uh, in terms of familiarity and, and common experiences between the incoming and outgoing administration. Ziad, would you be able to share with us some general thoughts? I mean, I think you know most of the people whose names have been announced very, very well, but without getting into specifics, some general thoughts on what you think in terms of Biden's picks so far? I think we're, you know, obviously we don't yet have the full slate of the cabinet nominees. I think obviously, notably for those following more on the geopolitical side, uh, the defense secretary is yet to be formally put forward. But I think what we're seeing is a team that, you know, I've had the pleasure of working with a number of the people um, who have been put forward, either at the Senate or the State Department. And, you know, I, I think they're just very seasoned, competent, uh, professionals who have been in foreign policy circles for a long time. There's a lot of extrapolation, of course, of their foreign policy bent. Um, many of them are uh, individuals who, you know, really espouse the multilateral approach, our engagement with their allies, you know, a U.S.-led order that depends not just on sort of force, but also example. So I think that will probably be 
something that a lot of um, you know colleagues uh, and, and counterparts in other capitals will welcome. But I think there's also a clear recognition that the world has changed over the last four years, and um, and so you know you're not starting from where you were four years ago um, in in Asia, and we can we'll talk more about this. Obviously, there's been all sorts of configurations, and we just had you know CPTPP earlier uh, in this administration go through without the U.S. and RCEP where the U.S. is involved. So the world has also moved on, and the geopolitical dynamics with, for example, China have sharpened. So. I think it's a it's an extremely competent and, and really really thoughtful group of colleagues, and I think they will have um, you know a, a new world in which they need to navigate and and see how they how the U.S. and and lead the U.S. to a new form of engagement in in this era. Right. I think there's also the political angle, which is that you know Biden needs to pick people who are not only seasoned but also have a high degree of likelihood to uh, go through the nomination process, and uh, in a way. With the Senate outcome still somewhat uncertain, I think that has also been uh, a driving force in in terms of picking very middle of the road people. Uh, and so, you know, we we expect hopefully something along the lines in in the coming nominations as well. Um, Ziad, uh, let's talk about uh, some of the implications of Trump to Biden transition as far as Asia is concerned. You dealt with many really important issues relevant to Asia. For example, you helped co-develop uh, President Obama's signature economic initiative for Southeast Asia, uh, the U.S.-ASEAN Connect. Uh, I want to hear your view on U.S.-ASEAN relationship. We've had the RCEP-type developments in the last couple of weeks. And uh, of course, you know everything is under the shadow of the U.S.-China relationship. So we'll talk about U.S.-China later. But for now, perhaps just the notion of U.S.-ASEAN. So I think uh, the way I think about it is there's sort of the three axes. I mean, there's there's sort of a security dimension to the U.S. ASEAN relationship. There's a economic dimension, and then there's sort of the diplomatic, political dimension. And 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 all through these, I mean, on the security front, I think there there has been obviously a fair bit of engagement, even under this Trump administration, and obviously with fluctuations. But if you think of sort of the posture in the South China Sea, um, you know, with countries like Vietnam and the Philippines. There's been a fair bit of activity there, and it's a question of, you know, how is the Biden administration going to take that forward? On the diplomatic political front, I'm sure ASEAN uh, leaders would have uh, appreciated more uh, physical presence from the, you know, the cabinet level from the Trump administration at key meetings and, and summits and so on. Um, but at the same time, you know, I think what will be interesting to see is uh, how are some of the issues around human rights talked about with the new team? Um, obviously, that the, the typical narrative is Democrats tend to be more focused on those issues. Um, I'm not sure. I think that's a bit of a simplistic framework um, because we've certainly seen Republican administrations in the past be focused, but there will be something there in terms of how that evolves. But I think on the economic front, it's interesting that it goes to your U.S. ASEAN Connect question because the the impetus behind U.S. ASEAN Connect was at that moment in time, the U.S. obviously was very much leading uh, the TPP negotiations, and many ASEAN countries weren't in TPP. Some were, but uh, in Vietnam, for example, Singapore, but others weren't. And so the desire was to say that even as the U.S. has a broader political relationship with ASEAN, including reflected, for example, in setting up a U.S. mission to ASEAN with that embassy being in Jakarta, um, is there sort of an equivalent economic relationship that's much more broad based? And that's where US ASEAN Connect came in as an effort to really you know, engage across the region on trade, on infrastructure, uh, and, and a whole host of other issues on development. I think, you know, obviously a, a big question will be what will be the US's trade posture um, in the Biden administration, because that will shape um the strategy in big part, right? And I don't think anyone is necessarily thinking that, the, that we'll be jumping back in here to CPTPP and RCEP is a bit of a different story at this point where the U.S. isn't there. So there is a question here of what else uh, will the U.S. look to do in the economic space? Because part of the partnerships in ASEAN is to really also speak to and connect with the development imperatives and goals. And connectivity has been a big theme in ASEAN at a number of the ASEAN summits. So how does the U.S. get behind the agenda of its allies and friends in the region um, in a way that's positive and proactive and not sort of just focused on the kind of trade and tariff type conversations that have been sharper? So I would suspect we'll see some new version of ASEAN Connect across administrations 
labels often change, but the fundamental imperative is to speak to its partners in this region in a way that isn't just driven by sort of, you know, security considerations, but are also driven by kind of a shared prosperity agenda, uh, which I think leads to, to initiatives like US ASEAN Connect, whatever avatar it takes this time around. Uh, Ziad, in terms of timing for a reset or revival of uh, U.S. ASEAN Connect, uh, I, I hear that you know there will be a great deal of inward focus initially, especially with the COVID crisis and the fiscal stimulus and so on. That geopolitics, as important as it is, uh, may take a backseat initially. Uh, do you agree with that sort of uh, argument? I mean, at one level, that's that's correct. Obviously, you know, we're in the midst of a global pandemic over here. The U.S. has been hit. There's an economic part of it. There's a public health dimension. So certainly, there is going to be a great deal of political capital and energy that will go into solving those core domestic issues. But, you know, I mean, at the same time, there is an analogy of you being able to walk and, and chew gum here, whereby, you know, there will be very seasoned national security professionals who um, who know that you can't sort of leave these issues to just be out there in the wind and you need to get to it. So, of course, there may be certain kind of top line issues that need to really kind of await and, and will take time to get around. A big part of this, the more is personnel. I mean, when do you get the key ambassadors to the key capitals um, who can then actually drive and help drive the policy on the ground? But I think we'll start seeing a lot of things um, in terms of just the, the, you know, firstly language, secondly engagement, and kind of showing up at some of the key summits. But it, it takes time for the next for a new team to develop its own sort of set of initiatives. You need the right, you need the people to be in place. So yeah, I don't think we should expect in February of 2020 for there to be a grand strategy document. But typically, there will be a national security strategy rolled out over the course of the first year, and we will start seeing um, actions. I mean, I think there's also just some element of running with things that are already in place and maybe doing it in a really different emphasis. And let's not forget, they're just sort of institutional structures. They are defense treaties. They are military exercises. There is a certain calendar of symmetry. So I, I wouldn't say that foreign policy waits until the domestic issues are taken care of. Certainly, there's a question of sequencing on the big issues requiring political capital. But there will be a lot of work that can't wait. I mean, within 15 days of the administration starting, there's, a, there's the issue of the START treaty with Russia expiring. And so they're right off the bat, you have an arms control agreement. There's the issue of true presence in Afghanistan and negotiations. So, you know, there isn't the luxury to, to wait. Um, but yes, there will have to be some degree of what, can, what cannot wait and what needs to wait because there are other priorities. And that's part of the, the balancing that the team around would have to do. Sure. And of course, one of the key issues that simply cannot wait even a day would be the U.S.-China uh, relationship, which has had uh, its uh, moments in the last four years. And uh, I'm curious to know, you know, your, your view on that. Uh, I, I note that, you know, you worked on the inaugural U.S.-China development dialogue. So uh, walk us through your view on where U.S.-China matters go from here. So I, think, I mean, we've certainly, Tamar, like stepping back, we're living in a moment, but if you were to step back and think of the arc of U.S.-China relations, there was clearly a phase of engagement. And then, you know, somewhere, you know, around 2015, 16, and you start looking at the, the GFC, there was a moment, an inflection point where, you know, and with President Xi coming to office, there's a much more sort of transition point that we were in. And in the last four years, it's gone from engagement to sort of transition to a phase of, of competition. And I think those of us who were previously in the administration in the Obama years were, in hindsight, living through a phase of transition where there was an imperative to really actually do some important cooperative things um, with China as well as the kind of competitive. And the U.S.-China development dialogue you referred to was very much in that spirit, as, of course, was the entire effort to engage with China on Paris and climate. And on development, for example, I mean, China is a very significant player in this arena. And, you know, there, there's a lot of um, area of collaboration that we were thinking through back then. Uh, I mean, the world has changed now in the sense that it is a much more competitive lens. And, and the new team has talked about that extensively. Um, so at the same time, though, there isn't sort of a wholesale rejection of doing anything cooperative. And I suspect we will see more efforts uh, around, for example, climate change in particular, maybe even around 
uh, pandemic response, we'll be able to see the cooperative elements. But I think we just have to, um, you know, be prepared that there will be sort of sharp and enduring uh, competitive aspects here, and sharper than they were when many of the, the new incoming team were were there previously. And more broadly, looking beyond sort of uh, this administration or the previous one, I mean, the Trump administration, the incoming one, I think it's important to think of this as sort of what are the kind of uh, axes of uncertainty, because no one really has a clear sense of which way things will go. But what are some of the axes that we should be looking at? There is certainly, you know, take a big marker and draw a circle around trade and technology. And what is the sort of nature, what's the direction of travel on the technology relationship and competition between the U.S. and China, um, you know, and so there's something over there, and we've often the shorthand for that becomes decoupling, which can be a very simplistic term, but that's one space to watch. What's what's the direction of that? I think the other is very importantly the domestic politics in the U.S. and, and China. I mean, China is a one-party system, but it has its own pushes and pulls within its system, um, and there's an element of how these the politics of both countries are within themselves and how they dynamically shape each other as well. Um, so if the U.S. or China continues to sort of take what the other views as escalatory actions, that will harden the politics. So there is a question here of, you know, how will the kind of politics of the countries define the arc? That's another axis of uncertainty. I think the third one for me would be just, you know, think of it as sort of strategic flashpoints, the Taiwans, the South China Seas and so on, where is there a possibility of a conflict getting triggered by some, you know, a mishap out there on high water, high seas, and escalating up. And then I think a fourth thing, which we oftentimes don't talk as much about, but it is it is an important kind of access to watch, is how is the rest of the world going to re- respond? This isn't a U.S.-China world alone. It's an increasingly multipolar world. Um, you know, I mean, again, ASEAN leading the pack on RCEP is an example of that for me personally. I think a lot of the media has characterized RCEP as sort of a China-led initiative, and I, I don't think that's the case. I think, in fact, it is us. It has been ASEAN-led, and it's a reflection of a more multipolar world. So when we think of U.S.-China, I think it's also important to just think of the how the other countries, the Germanys, the Australias, and you know, the Indias um, engage in this space. So uh, along with saying, Tamur, uh, that there are certain uh, you know issues, and there's a certain clearly paradigm shift that's been occurring over the last uh, you know, four to eight years, and there is a much more sharper competitive dimension, but there are fundamentally looking over the horizon, these four areas um, you know, that we need to keep our eyes out that will determine how this evolves. And I think prudent planning as a policymaker, as a you know, business uh, executive requires thinking about those different scenarios. Ziad, we have been uh, worrying quite a bit about these areas of competition and potential conflict. What about the areas of cooperation? I I know that already the Biden administration has pointed out that they would join the WHO. So with vaccine development, could we see U.S.-China come together in leading a global initiative and inoculating the whole world in the next couple of years? Could we see the U.S.-China come together on some other areas where that act of cooperation then diffuses uh, the tension that comes from the inevitable areas of competition? I think those are the two that, you know, that would come to mind. I mean, I would start, I mean, climate, clear, clearly, there is there is just, there is no meaningful solution to the existential challenge of climate change without the U.S. and China finding some way forward. I think if you kind of peel the layer below that, of course, there are competitive dynamics to climate change. I mean, there's a question of who is leading on the green technologies of the future. But I would like to think that there is an ability to kind of, yep, that's just healthy industrial, you know, competition. But there is an existential crisis that requires the countries at that level to work together. So that's one. On on um, on the vaccine side of things, and of course, COVAX, China is you know part of that. The U.S. is not. That may shift clearly the WHO. So I would like to think that there is more scope for that type of cooperation. Um, certainly, that is much needed. And you know, in the past, we have seen these moments when there have been major financial crises that forums like the G20 have been able to play a leadership role. And I think we sorely need that in an instance like this where, you know, really there isn't any way for one country to be entirely inoculated from COVID if another country, you know, or significant numbers of economies are afflicted. So the kind of transnational threats, be it climate or pandemics, 
those really can't be solved until you have sort of you know the world's top economies on the same page. And I think then it's about just realizing that even as that happens, there will be competition, and then how can that be managed in a way that doesn't lead to you know catastrophe, so to speak. Right, right. Uh, Ziel, I think another area that comes to my mind is uh, debt relief for uh, poor countries around the world, where I think the big difference between 09 crisis and this crisis is that there are several countries that are s- substantially indebted to China, and any sort of IMF, World Bank-led, or Paris Club-type uh, debt restructuring for uh, developing nations would have to include substantial amount of haircut from Chinese creditors, whether it's a sovereign or private creditors as well. So I'd like to hope that that is one area also there could be some cooperation and uh, somebody like Lel Brennard from the Federal Reserve eventually going to the IMF or something could help that. But this is just sort of <laughs> wishful thinking on my part. But but your point is very well taken, that particularly in the climate change, I think without US-China cooperation, uh, the world really doesn't have uh, much hope. So let, let's hope for that. Uh, Ziad, um, you also took part in advancing the passage of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And you've already touched on this issue a bit, but I'd like you to flesh this out a bit more as to when the big priority things are taken care of, or there is some simultaneous effort to take care of COVID and stimulus at home, but also reach out and normalize issues on trade and global cooperation abroad. Uh, what, where does TPP go? And has this RCEP deal been some sort of a wake-up call for U.S. policymakers? Yeah, so I, yeah, I think advancing the passage, clearly it, it, it didn't pass. And, and as, as we all know, looking back, I think the politics in the U.S. were not behind um, behind that passage, even though I think within the kind of foreign affairs community, there was a lot of support for a positive, proactive trade agenda in the region and sort of setting up a big tent. Um, and I think a lot of people talk, you, a lot of the analysis back then talked of it as sort of this is something that is going to, you know, is is a is a tool to be used against China. But having been at the State Department and traveled to China and talked to many Chinese interlocutors, it was quite fascinating as there was more momentum to have many Chinese officials, you know, express anything from curiosity to interest to to more to, to understanding what's in it, uh, what's in the agreement. And so, in effect, the 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 hope was to also have a bit of a magnetic pull. Where other where, where where many countries could just not stay out to include China, right? And it's interesting because you just now come full circle. Xi Jinping, uh, in discussing the CPTPP, was talking about you know maybe we would consider joining. So I, I think there's one thing I would just say looking back is the the danger of seeing these trade agreements as sort of tools of national security that block one party out. Of course, uh, you're setting standards, and that that is that is influence. But it was never meant to be a closed door to, to any country, so to speak. But now fast forward where we are today is, again, the politics aren't really aligned. And as you said, the political capital to jump into something like CPTPP is probably quite limited um, given other priorities. Um, but I think the importance of that agreement or more broadly a kind of a positive trade agenda is understood. Um, I could imagine there would be a number of sort of bilateral trade deals or more targeted sector-specific trade agreements around digital services that might be a focus of the new team. Um, but I think joining something um, like the CPTPP with the congressional approval that would require um, is probably going to be quite difficult in the near term. Uh, is RCEP a wake-up call? I, I think in some ways it, it is if you if you fall into the camp of saying, well, this is China-led and it's to the U.S.'s expense. Again, I think that's a quite a simplistic frame. But I think the, the issue here is just more around how does the U.S. kind of want to engage in this in this part of the world, right? And of course, there's been a lot of focus on the security and the geopolitical side, but there's also the geoeconomic side. And there's an element of countries in this region. Again, I come back to the point have core development needs. Um, they're in a different place, the development trajectory. So what is that agenda look like? And so I think um, it will be quite interesting to see where, if, it, if the approach, if you concur, that it will start with a much more kind of muted bilateral approach. What are the countries where there may be some room for progress or issues? And let's not forget that I think a big part of uh, situating trade within the economic engagement space is investment. And there are obviously lots of US companies doing great work across the region. So is there a better story to be told or are there other areas that they could engage in, including through you know, US government assistance, through development finance tools and so on? So I, I think we will probably have to sit for a bit 
so tied on the whole CPTPP debate and where that goes, um, given the politics. But I think it goes back to the point of, uh, you know, the interest and the appetite on both sides of the Pacific for a more, you know, positive and proactive economic agenda in the region. So, Zia, this is what I find absolutely fascinating, that from U.S. companies' perspective, the last four years, there have been so many roadblocks in terms of tariffs and entities list and so on. But when we look at the data, U.S. companies' investment in Asia is on an upward trajectory. U.S. companies' investment in China is on an upward tra- trajectory. So the, the, the sort of the diversion or the, the bifurcation between the news bites and the reality where U.S. companies remain very well engaged with Asia, I think is quite stark. And, and, and this is one area, it seems to me, that you know, we don't think too much about because the reality is that the American companies still continue to find value in investing and producing in Asia. And as you can see in the last three, four months, the U.S. trade deficit numbers, which is widening again, show that um, these uh, efforts to sort of reshore production and discourage imports haven't really succeeded. And the U.S. remains a big buyer of um, Asian products. Um, so we've talked largely about sort of geopolitics as a nation state level. But I think your last response also highlighted that intersection between geoeconomics and geopolitics. And since you did touch upon American companies, so let's talk about, you know, how U.S. companies or companies anywhere should prepare. So we're, we're not going to enter into a kumbaya world, as you've pointed out several times during this conversation, that the ground realities have shifted. You can't just go back to a status quo ante. We will live in a world of geopolitical volatility, maybe some different tone and tenor, but it will be there. So how are you advising companies or how do you think companies should prepare to manage the geopolitical risks that lie ahead? So I mean, I'm happy to share some reflections that were, again, we, we as McKinsey don't advise clients on, on geopolitical risk, but these are maybe just some personal reflections on how we think about these issues um, and just, uh, you know, even more personally, just from my own professional experience. I mean, I think, you know, fundamentally, they are, as you said, their, their investment in many areas is going up and it's, it's tracking, but I think a lot of this comes down to an industry by industry analysis and some industries clearly have felt the, the geopolitical tension much more sharply and it's and it's forced them to adapt supply chains uh, diversify and so on um, and others have you know i mean we've seen you know financial institutions get licenses to go into china and so on so it's a it's an interesting um it's an interesting duality and it isn't so simple as okay it's tensions up so business is down and, and vice versa so there's that nuance but i would say across the board there's no doubt that I think many companies have just had to kind of wake up and think to themselves, we're in a world now where we will be living with some enduring degree of um, competition between the US and China. And that requires thinking a little bit of how do we walk a, a bit of a tightrope. And for some, it'll be a thinner tightrope than others. And so, I mean, I think in that regard, as one thinks of that, there is sort of maybe three lenses. I mean, one is, just being much more agile on issues as they come up, right? I mean, if you're working in a particular sector and you wake up and there's, you know, major international coverage and, you know, the New York Times test that, okay, hey, wait a second, this sector or this company is problematic. Are you as a company able to quickly respond? Are you able to even kind of glean the insights and have the conversations with policymakers and experts to get that? A lot of companies aren't uh, configured to do that. They don't quite have that risk network that they need to pick up insights. I think the typical model tends to be much more government and regulatory affairs, which is focused on the kind of, you know, regulatory issues, but the strategic things that come up. So how do you kind of think about that? And that's important because you really can't support decision-making if you don't quite have a nuanced sense of what's happening on the ground um, and and what direction may a particular policy take. So there's an element of just sort of near-term crisis response as issues come up. You know, you have an executive who's been detained um, there's a new sanction that's been rolled out uh, that may significantly affect someone you're partnering with. Are you prepared to respond and adapt? So there's that kind of near-term uh, muscle that I think companies need to have. Then there's a sort of a question of, you know, over the horizon as you're dealing with different issues, there's some degree of stepping back and thinking about, okay, what's my product line? What's my service line? And, and what are the areas that are going to be, that could be sensitive 
um, down the road? I mean, like you're in the technology space, obviously you're thinking through the tech stack. Uh, and how do you kind of get ahead of that and make certain decisions about what products or services you offer? You know, similarly, for those of us uh, who are in the world of sort of putting out reports and so many companies are, I mean, they all have sort of the thought leadership arms, thinking about that content, the messaging, the framing that's put in that, that's an important area of thinking through your risk. People oftentimes think of this as just your actions and your products and services, but you know, what's the content you're putting out and what's the broader narrative that you are that's important to think through. And then there's sort of a whole host of very operational things. As I was saying, I mean, we're now in a world where the US, there's a lot more use of sanctions and entity list designations, but the US isn't alone. I mean, China has what's called the unreliable entity list. Other countries are rolling out frameworks on screening inbound foreign investment. So there's just a lot more regulatory risk to think through. And it's it's not purely just legal. It's also just important because, for example, with the entity list, it's not that if a company is on it, business is, is not allowed. It's You can do it if you get a license. So legally, potentially permissible, but reputationally isn't so. So these conversations aren't, no, from my point of view, aren't just about kind of strict legal compliance conversations, but there's sort of a holistic assessment that's needed on some of the operational risks. But then I think, you know, again, an important element of this is you may have to deal with immediate crisis issues and you may have to think about a host of operational and kind of knowledge, thought leadership and, you know, your products and services. But there's something over the horizon. I mean, over a four-year U.S. administration, where is the world headed over the next 20 to 30 years? Where is U.S.-China relations headed? Uh, and kind of walking backwards from those types of issues and thinking, how are we as a company positioned over the long term? How are our networks positioned? How is our data security? How do we want to think of growing or not growing? So the point is that, you know, having at the board level some sense of a framework and, uh, you know, a temporal lens of issues that need to be dealt with now, issues we need to deal with on an ongoing basis and long term, it's important, I think, for companies to start having those conversations with their senior leaders in a way that isn't just driven by X administrative action or Y, but is driven by sort of a let's think of let's take the long view um, and really develop a muscle to help us deal with it that needs to blend frankly what as a typical legal team and a risk team and a communications team in a much more integrated way right Ziad, help me understand one issue the u.s after all is a federal nation and state courts and state laws sometimes can proceed uh without necessarily blessing or or uh, endorsement from the White House. So on, for example, U.S.-China matters, on issues like weaponizing the U.S. dollar, could, for example, the courts in New York go after Chinese companies and Chinese banks even without any sort of, uh, sort of, you know, encouragement from the White House? Well, certainly, I mean, up to a point they can, and it can go both ways. I mean, you may have sometimes you have the federal government that's taking a, a tough line on certain issues, but you have governors leading state delegations and and trying to, you know, attract inbound investment. And then that can lead to some interesting places because that inbound investment could run into CFIA screening. So, I, I mean, I think there's some there's some scope where it may be to flip the script somewhere where the states might be leaning in or wanting to lean in a bit more than at the federal level. And, and then conversely, sure, there are areas where the states uh, could potentially take action or could make statements around, for example, state pension funds or so on that may have a restrictive aspect to it. Um, it's interesting, we haven't seen as many notable examples of that so far. I, we tend to see sort of where the states sort of have this much more you know, focus on how do we kind of deal with the, the trade and investment and build those commercial ties. And you know, having been a CFIUS attorney, I saw a fair bit of that. But, you know, that, that might change over time as well. And, and that is the challenge of the federal system is how do you do it? I mean, ultimately, on foreign affairs, it's, it rests really with uh, the federal government per, you know, extensive Supreme Court jurisprudence. It's a great deal of deference, but there are nuances. And we're also just in a world where we talk about things like, you know, city diplomacy, city to city. And Mike Bloomberg obviously has been leading a lot of this thinking on the role that cities can play on key issues like climate and the collaborations they can form. And um, during the Trump administration, we clearly saw the governor of California, uh, you know, engage in much more in a way that, uh, according to some, the federal government was. And so it's a very good point and the nuances to draw between the different levels of the U.S. government. Uh, and let's not forget the different branches of the U.S. government, too. Um, of course, we're talking a lot about the Biden administration, but we don't know who will control the Senate. And, 
and uh, you know there's a question of what direction, what's the legislation, and the language that comes out of that branch of government that also shapes policy and views. Do you feel that U.S. businesses are more conciliatory or more constructive with respect to engagement in China versus U.S. politicians, or the U.S. politicians are basically reflecting the mood in the country? I think, again, it really just depends on the, the company, the sector, the industry. I mean, each of them, will, each company, a sector will have its own calculus. I think in the last few years, certainly we've seen a range of companies that, you know, have probably been more supportive in, because in their view of tougher action, because in their view, it's not been a level playing field. There are other companies that have probably felt and have argued that by taking such punitive actions, you cut off important linkages that benefit U.S. companies and U.S. production and markets. And there's another segment that says by taking punitive actions, you're in effect, you know, accelerating this decoupling that leads to a building up of tech self-sufficiency that in the long term may impact the U.S. and its interests. So uh, it's, again, hard to, you know, I think you put the, the business community into one clear point of view. Um, it really does depend on um, a bit of a sectoral analysis on their, on their interest. Some of that obviously gets reflected into the political debate, but there are other elements here as well. I mean, you know, obviously there's a mood in the U.S. around trade and um, the impact on jobs. And, and that's not just about China, obviously, that's broader, more broadly also about globalization writ large. So I wouldn't say that the China debate is purely just a business lens one. Um, but, it, but within the business side of things, I would say it just requires a few different cuts to, to kind of unpack where we are. Right. Um, one thing that I noticed over the last couple of years was that the U.S. companies to deal with these, you know, series of tariff increases and um, various you know, restrictions on investment, uh, both inward and upward, were recruiting, you know, large numbers of lobbyists and lawyers and uh, accountants to help them navigate through this complexity. Um, did those, uh, you know, difficulties result in some degree of pushback for the Trump administration where the businesses, at least privately, were complaining that, you know, life was becoming more challenging? Or was the sort of the nationalistic tone within the Trump administration so strong that there really wasn't any receptive uh, tone to, to those sort of complaints from businesses that their cost of doing business was going up because of the trade war? Look, I, I mean, I think... It's an ongoing conversation. I mean, you know, having worked at the State Department, the Economics Bureau, I, I was our special representative for commercial and business affairs in the Obama administration. My role was to meet on a monthly basis with all the top business associations and to kind of, you know, have a two-way conversation. Here's sort of a policy view. What's the business view? Um, and those those dialogues very much inform the posture. It's hard for me to obviously comment on to what degree in which those the business community's concerns were were taken up. I think it's, I would kind of shift it a little bit to sort of what are the tools that the U.S. government has around shaping the business environment, be it sanctions or entity list designations. And, you know, I think a lot of people stop when they just see, oh, a new designation has been made or a new sanctions are rolled out. But there's a lot that happens within the kind of notice and comment period uh, and the specific rule that's developed to implement that announcement. And that's really where the conversations happen with the business community to find the balance and I think it's been interesting to see a number of cases where there have been some, you know, companies that have been put on an entity list um, and to do business with them, licenses have to be granted. So a lot of people have just assumed that, oh, there's no way you can do business with them. But then all of a sudden you see a lot of companies are getting licenses. So once again, I think this is that fidelity and nuance that one needs to have in looking at, you know, particularly the U.S. government's actions is there's that distinction between what sort of federal government policy what's an authority that has been used, and then what's the actual details uh, of how that authority will be used. And then lastly, how is it being practically implemented and executed? And I think as you go down the chain, you, uh, kind of the practicality and the execution, you land up seeing a lot more gray and it's less of a kind of a, a zero sum picture than sometimes the media makes it out that there's been this sort of permanent rupture in trade and investment relations. And I think the numbers you were pointing to allude to that. Now. Is that going to stay constant? Will it, the temperature go up or down? I think everyone has their theories, but what I was saying about the sort of four axes of uncertainty is to, is I think it behooves companies to take a much longer view. 
than just you know an administration or two for that matter and just think of um you know the, the way in which there are these different areas that are unclear and then the way the ways in which the u.s government as well as the chinese government and other governments what are the tools that they have and how are they going to be used very very helpful uh Ziad, before i let you go i know that you are an avid reader and an avid listener of podcasts um, so to those of us who want to keep tab on what's happening on the U.S. new administration side with the transition, the thinking, latest thinking on geopolitical and geostrategy, what should we read and listen to these days? Well, that's a great question, Pamela. Thank you for asking. Uh, as I think through my Spotify list over here, um, you know, I... Frankly, I really enjoy The Economist's intelligence. I think for those of us who read The Economist, it's, it's great, but we're all spending so much time on screens that to be to kind of consume it in an audio format is great. So The Economist radio is terrific. Um, I think there's some sort of deeper dives on China-Asia issues. So uh, Seneca is pretty good, I find, on China issues and from different angles, not just political. Um, Tea Leaves podcast uh, is excellent as well. A lot of really good interviews. Um, I think, I mean, if you have an interest on the technology side, you know, you have, for example, a Vergecast that does some really good deeper dive on technology type topics. Um, but, you know, I would say this as well, like there is, uh, and then, you know, G0 with Ian Bremmer's uh, podcast is also, I think, quite good. But I would say that this is, I think, a, a, an area which requires a fair bit of, um, you know, creativity as as companies and countries, for that matter, try to walk that with these these various tight ropes. So I would also make a plug for I think to try to think through these issues effectively is to also have podcasts that have nothing to do with these topics and are a little bit more flights of fancy. Um, and, I, and I'll put in a plug for a couple over there. I think one in particular that I really enjoy is is BBC and Our Times, uh, and these are much more about kind of great works of literature. Um, but I find that those themes are way a, a welcome break from geopolitics. But then when you come back to those types of hard topics, you come back with a much richer perspective. So I'd, I'd strongly recommend in our in our time as well. And let's not forget them with the value of just reading books. So I would put in a plug for um, for those of you who watch Amazon Prime, uh, The Man in High Castle. I think the book is much much more interesting than the show. Um, and so that would be one to pick up and read in hard copy as we try to give our eyes some rest as well. That's, that's great. Uh, I'm also a very big fan of In Our Times at BBC. Uh, Ziad Haider, thank you so much for your time and insights today. Yeah, more it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks to our listeners too. Copy Time was produced by Martin Taki. It is for information only and does not represent any trade recommendations. All 37 episodes of Copy Time are available on YouTube and on all major pl podcast platforms, including Apple, Google, and Spotify. As for our research publications, webinars, and live streams, you can find them all by Googling DBS Research Library. Have a great day. <laughs>